never conquer me Cause I belong to Jesus Oh fear you'll never conquer me Cause I belong to Jesus Oh fear you'll never conquer me Cause I belong to Jesus Oh fear you'll never conquer me Cause I belong Come on speak to that giant in front of you tonight Oh fear you'll never conquer me Cause I belong to Jesus I know whose I am Fear you'll never conquer me Cause I belong to Jesus Oh fear you won't Fear you'll never conquer me Cause I belong to Jesus Oh fear you'll never conquer me Whether it's in the family or in business can be frustrating and also produce shame. We worry that people will find out and think we can't get along with others or just difficult. Sometimes conflict is long standing and you understand the issue. Other times it's just tension in the air that keeps people apart, like issues of blended families, politics, or race. Our world is hurting and divided. So many are struggling to connect, and this spills over to God's people. The Hills Church wants you to know we see your pain. We want to help. The Conflict Resolution Center is made up of trained individuals experienced in conflict resolution of all types. The Hills wants to meet you where you are and assist you whether the conflict is between neighbors, business partners, or within a family. We've helped couples walk through a hard conversation. Business partners create agreements that keep them out of court and have seen extended family reconcile. The Conflict Resolution Center is free, it's confidential, and it's based on biblical principles. We offer several different services and have members at all three campuses to maintain your confidentiality. We have trained mediators to help with complex conflicts, conflict coaches who work one-on-one -on -one with you to learn how to deal with difficult people even when the other party doesn't want to resolve the issue, and training on resolving conflict. Sometimes changing how you react to the relationship can change the dynamic. Please don't live another day without peace as much as it depends on you. To contact us, please email the email on the screen right now or contact the main church office. We would love to hear from you, even if you just have questions about whether or not it would be appropriate um, to use our services. We're here for you. Everybody, good morning to you. Let's all stand up together. We're going to sing this old hymn. Some call it 728B. Our God, He is alive. It is a great song. Let's sing it. There is beyond the azure blue a God concealed from human sight. 
He tinted the skies with heavenly hue and framed the worlds with his great mind. There is a God. prophets heard he is the god that we should know who speaks from his inspired word there is a god to give that he from sin might set them free and evermore with him could live there is a God all the hosts of heaven who else could make every king bow down who else can whisper and darkness trembles only a holy god what other beauty demands such praises what other splendor outshines the sun what other majesty rules with justice? Only a holy God. Come and behold him, the one and the only. Cry now, sing holy, forever a holy God. Come and worship the holy consumes like fire what other power can raise the dead what other name remains undefeated only a holy god come and behold him the one and the only Christ
worship the Holy God, forever a Holy God. Come and worship the Holy God. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God. Born of His Spirit, washed in His blood. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission. Perfect delight, visions of rapture now burst on my sight. Angels descending bring from above echoes of mercy, whispers of love. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, all is at rest. I am my Savior and happy and blessed, watching and waiting, looking above. Filled with His goodness, lost in His love. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior. from Hebrews chapter 4. It says, For the Word of God is alive and powerful. It is sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword, cutting between soul and spirit, between joint and marrow. It exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God. Everything is naked and exposed before His eyes, and He is the one to whom we are accountable. So then, since we have a great high priest who has entered heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to what we believe. This high priest of ours understands our weaknesses, for he faced all of the same testings we do, yet he did not sin. So let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. There we will receive his mercy and we will find grace to help us when we need it most. You were the word at the beginning, one with God the Lord most high. Your hidden glory in creation now revealed. What a beautiful name it is, nothing compares to this. What a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus. You didn't want heaven without us, so Jesus, you Sin was great, your love was greater. What could separate us now? What a wonderful name it is. What a wonderful name it is. The name of Jesus. 
Jesus Christ, my King. What a wonderful name it is. Nothing compares to this. What a wonderful name it is. The name of Jesus. What a wonderful name it is. The name of Jesus. Death could not hold you. The veil tore before you. You silenced the boast of sin and grave. The heavens are roaring. The praise of your glory.
This week, as I was preparing for uh, communion, uh, the Lord put on my heart Romans 3, and I wasn't really quite sure what to do with that, but after reading through it a couple times, I think it's pretty clear. Um, so I'm just going to read it, because I know that God's work will, will uh, speak much better and much more clearly than I can. So this is Romans 3:21. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. Please pray with me. God, we love you. We thank you for our redemption, even though we are undeserving of it. We thank you for the blood of Jesus that cover, covers us and makes us clean. And Lord, we pray and ask for a spirit of gratitude that we'll always carry this with us. That the loving and merciful work that Jesus did on the cross is never dulled in our hearts and minds but instead it drives us and leads us in a life full of faith. I pray all this in the wonderful name of Jesus, amen. I speak the name of Jesus over you, in your hurting, in your sorrow, I will ask my God to move, I speak the name cause it's all that I can do, in desperation I'll seek heaven and pray Inside would flee 
In Jesus' name, I pray that a breakthrough would happen today. I pray miracles over your life. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Man, it's because of Jesus that we're here. Amen, church. Well, welcome to the hills. We are so glad that you're with us, whether you are in person or joining us online. Uh, we love that you're spending part of your weekend with us to stop and to reflect on who we believe in. And maybe you're still exploring uh, even what you believe. We're so glad that you are here. In fact, if, if you're new, uh, we'd love the opportunity to get to know you. And so uh, you're going to see up on the screen an opportunity to, uh, to just text a number. And if you just text the word new, uh, man, we, we just love the opportunity to be able to connect with you and hear kind of what you're wanting to discover. And maybe Maybe, maybe you're new in town and looking for a church home. There's always more room in our church family. Hills members say amen. Or maybe, maybe you are somebody who was invited or you're, you're uh, exploring more about the truths of Christianity. I, I'm so glad that you are with us today. But we'd love for you to text that number and somebody from our team will reach out. As a church, uh, we are an intergenerational church and we love worshiping with every generation in the room because we're shaped by what we see. And so at this time, I'm gonna actually invite our first through fifth graders uh, to stand and uh, it's, yeah, it is first through fifth grade. I always second guess myself. Uh, to stand and head to the back of the room to our Hills Kids team there in bright green shirts that say the Hills Kids. And they're gonna uh, take you kids to your Bible study groups at this time where you're gonna hear more about Jesus, uh, the name above every name and the God who made you and who loves you. Uh, and in a, in a moment, we're gonna do that as well through our message. Um, but first, uh, one of the things that we do as, as a church, we exist, our mission is to make and grow followers of Jesus. And, and one of the ways that we do that is as we practice what Jesus taught and how, what Jesus modeled, uh, we, we try to take next steps following after Jesus. And that includes the step of giving generously. So you can see on screen the ways to give. This is something we do every week as a church family because we try not only to give as Jesus taught, but to give as Jesus gave. Jesus gave of his life, which we've remembered through communion. Jesus gave uh, of his time and his presence and attention to others. And yet Jesus also gave of himself. 
Uh, now, for Jesus, that was lots of different ways. For us, one of the ways we do that is actually through uh, our financial generosity. And as we do that, we leverage every dollar that's given to make and grow followers of Jesus. We do that through a number of different ways, and one of those is through our annual conferences, our men's and women's conference. And women's conference is only a few days away. It's this Friday night and Saturday morning. Uh, it's gonna be an amazing time. I've, I've been around the kind of behind the scenes with some of the team who are planning and working on the conference, and it's just gonna be incredible. Uh, my wife, Courtney, is signed up. Up. She's going. Uh, women here at the Hills, if you have not registered, there is still space, uh, but man, you've got a limited amount of time to make it happen. So, so go, go online uh, and you can, you can register. It's going to be an incredible, incredible time. And man, if you haven't yet, invite a friend. Maybe it's a coworker or a neighbor. Uh, maybe it is, uh, it is a younger woman in your life that you could invite, but this is gonna be an amazing event. I can't wait to hear, uh, even from, uh, from some of the women in my life, when they come back from Women's Conference, what they experienced. It's gonna, it's gonna be powerful. Now, as a church, our mission is to make and grow. But our vision is a five-year vision to ask for nations and generations. Uh, in fact, this month, over the last two weeks, we, we kind of did a, a, a recast and an update of nation's goals and generation's goals. Uh, but, but I never want us to forget the first word of that vision is actually the verb that belongs to the church, and that is to ask. We are asking God to reach the nations. We're asking God to impact generations. We're asking God to bring his kingdom in the way that only he can. And so sometimes we just say prayer is the strategy. So Hills Church, I want you to know that next week we are going to begin a season of prayer, 40 days of prayer. And, and one of the ways to think about these 40 days is we're gonna be praying about, uh, about people and places related to our vision. We're gonna be praying about the people, the, the church planters that we support. We're gonna be praying about the missionaries who serve internationally. We're gonna be praying for our, our missions partners, organizations, for, for even us as a local church and our outreach to the lost. We're gonna be praying for the places, the cities where we're supporting these church plants, the, the, the nations where we have missionaries who are serving, even some of the, the people, groups, and places that are hostile to the spreading of God's word. We're gonna be praying for people and for places as we ask for nations and generations. And, and parents, I want you to know, we'll share more next week, but this is gonna be something that your kids can take part in. Well, we've got some ways that everyone's going to be able to participate in these 40 days of prayer. Because as much as the vision involves us serving or giving or engaging or, or signing up, the vision will only come to reality. A God-sized vision only comes to reality through God himself, amen? And so we, we're gonna ask over these next 40 days. Um, that's happening, that's gonna start next week. Uh, but this week, I'm very excited. We are starting a brand new series called A Faith Worth Remembering. And so actually, since prayer is the strategy, why not for all of us, uh, we just pray as we get ready to hear God's word taught by our senior teaching minister, Rick Atchley. Bow with me. God, we recognize that your word is inspired by the Holy Spirit to be able to teach us what reality looks like from your perspective, to be able to hand down to us truths and lessons that belong to the generations that you want us to know. And we recognize that your word isn't just something you want us to know, but to take the words of Jesus and the words of scripture and to put them into practice and live them out. So we pray right now, we pray for our brother Rick as he brings the word, uh, Holy Spirit, that you'd be with him. We pray for all of us, Holy Spirit, would you open our eyes, our minds, our hearts to your inspired word. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, welcome to the hills, all of you in person in North Richard Hills, Keller, and West Fort Worth, and especially all of you that watch online and are a part of our uh, weekly fellowship. My name is Rick. I'm the senior teaching minister here at the hills, and I'm starting a new series today that I think is going to bless you, but first, a quick look back at the last two weeks. If you weren't with us, we recast our vision. Uh, two weeks ago, we talked about asking for nations, and then last week, asking for generations. We have a website 
nationsandgenerations.org that I would encourage you to check out regularly as you pray about this vision. And uh, one of the largest parts of this vision is to see more families uh, foster. So far, we've had five families because of our vision register and get licensed to foster. And just recently, we had our third placement. Let me see this picture. So notice they're wearing their Nations and Generations t-shirts. So here's the backstory. Bobby and uh, Stephanie Simons come to our church. They come to Vision Night. They both leave with the same sense that God is calling them to foster. And so they just recently had two precious kids placed with them, their daughter Ella. And here's what only God could do. So last week, you might recall at the end of the sermon, I had all the church stand up and get in groups and pray. So they stand up and meet a couple behind them they do not know named Harry and Wanda Brewer. Longtime members of our church who just happened to have fostered 40 children over the last 10 years. Only God could have orchestrated that meeting and had them pray together. So I encourage you, pray for our foster families. Pray for every aspect of our vision. We're launching 40 days of prayer next Sunday, and I think it's going to be an awesome thing to do together. Now, I'm going to show you three more pictures. Now, I have tried very, very hard in my 33 years of ministry here not to take advantage of this platform to talk about my family all the time. In fact, most of you don't even know in the last several years, two of my children got married. I never mentioned it from the pulpit. Well, I'll make an exception because you only become a grandfather first, one time ever, okay? So all of you online, all of you at every campus, get ready to meet Sadie James Hamilton, my precious granddaughter. Now, I know... You're all thinking the exact same thing. That is the most perfect baby I have ever witnessed. And I totally get that. A lot of credit, of course, goes to her uh, father and my mother. My daughter, Morgan, you see in this picture, is proud and holding her. Morgan went through 35 hours of labor and eventually had to have a C-section. I'm just going to make a blanket statement. Don't argue with me. Women are tougher than men, okay? <laughs> They're much tougher than men. Praise God for all the ladies. And then finally, this picture, you see Jamie and I getting to hold her for the very first time. Now, all the ladies are looking at my face and thinking, oh, she is going to have him wrapped around her finger. Not going to, already has. Okay. <laughs> I walked up, literally, I walked up to her the first time I saw her. I stuck out my little finger. She grabbed it and we made a pack. From now on, she is my boss. Okay. <laughs> looking at Jamie's face, all the guys are thinking, preacher is about to be broke. And you are right. I had no idea how many bows you can buy on a phone on the way to the hospital. And I couldn't be more delighted. Now, obviously, even more than normal, I've been thinking this week about generational impact. See, I know it's my responsibility to spoil her, but I think even more seriously, it's my responsibility to help disciple her. Now, like most of us, there's a good chance if she lives a long life, and I pray that she does, my granddaughter will live more years with memories of me than she will have lived having moments with me. Don't feel bad about that statement. I'll be with Jesus, but that's the reality. And so it makes me think, what memories of me do I want her to have? And what I hope she will remember most is that her grandfather was a true believer. So open your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 11. And that's where we're going to be for the next seven weeks. The book of Hebrews was written to Jewish people who had accepted Jesus as Messiah they were experiencing struggle and some persecution, and the author is writing to firm up their faith in Jesus. And he does so by going back to some of their favorite stories in their tradition, and they're all in Hebrews chapter 11. And the chapter starts like this. Now, faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. So the first thing we learn is that true faith is not dependent on sight. It believes what it cannot see. Maybe it cannot see it because it's already happened. Like, for example, I fully believe 
in the resurrection of Jesus. I believe the evidence for his validity is overwhelming, but I was not an eyewitness. I believe in what I did not see happen. Or maybe it's because it hasn't happened yet. I fully believe that Jesus is going to return, but I haven't seen it because it hasn't happened yet. Or maybe I can't see it because it exists in the unseen realm, which I believe is as real as the seen realm. Now, the author knows that what he's just said is kind of esoteric, that you believe in what you can't see. And so what he does is, now let me help you understand what I mean. And he tells stories, stories of confident faith. 21 times in Hebrews 11, he's going to use the expression, by faith, and tell a story. Because real faith, faith worth remembering, always has a story attached to it. Let me say that again. A faith worth remembering always comes with a story, not just a statement. Look again at verse 2. Faith is the reason we remember great people who lived in the past. And that leads into the foundation for this entire series, and it's one statement, that lived faith is relived faith. When you actually live your faith, you make stories that get told and get told and get told even after you are gone. Now, when we read the chapter, we're going to realize these stories are not about perfect people. Noah got drunk. Abraham lied. David was the Bible's most famous adulterer. Moses murdered a man. These are stories of flawed people, but they have this one common thread. They didn't just believe in God. They believed God. You know, you can believe in God and not believe him because faith is a noun, but you remember the faith that gets a verb attached to the noun. So all through this chapter, notice the verbs. Abel offered, Noah built, Jacob blessed, Moses kept, Israel passed through, Rahab welcomed. They lived faith. And the consequence was a story worth telling and retelling. They believed the God they believed in. Because a faith worth remembering is God confident. So each week we're going to teach you one big principle about a faith worth remembering. And here's the big one this week. Faith worth remembering is confident in God. Look at verse six. Without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. I've I've told you before, the the best line of A.W. Tozer, one of my favorite authors, was this. Whatever comes into your mind when we think about God is the most important thing about us. When you think God, whatever comes into your mind, shapes you and forms you. And so the writer says, God is pleased when you think of God and two thoughts Come to your mind. And here's the first. Faith reveals confidence in God's realness. God is pleased when we believe that he exists. The foundation of faith is in the beginning, God. Okay, now we're going to wade for a couple of minutes into some deep water. I do not believe faith is anti-intellectual. I did not turn off my brain to become a believer in God. Faith is not anti-intellectual, but it must be acknowledged that if God exists, he is beyond finite intellect. Here's what I mean. If God exists, he must be uncaused. And here's the problem. 
Everything we understand, we understand by studying causes. This is the role of science, to explain causes. So if God exists and is uncaused, then you can explain him the way we explain everything else. And this causes some people to give up on God because he refuses to play by their rules. But if that's where you are this morning, I want to challenge you to be intellectually honest enough to admit what else you give up on when you give up on the idea of the realness of God. For example, if we are just highly evolved lumps of carbon, you need to give up the notion there's some absolute moral code everyone should observe. You need to give up the idea that there is some kind of universal sense of justice we should all acknowledge. Secularism can tell you what is. It cannot tell you what ought to be. I'm not saying you can't have moral thoughts or behaviors or feelings, or at least by your definition of moral. You can think what you think is right, but you have no right to say that what you think is right is right for anybody else. There is no standard. Consequently, survival of the fittest is the ultimate law of the universe. Be honest and admit that. That the whole notion of justice is unattainable if you give up on God. And if we are just random cosmic accidents, then the idea that our lives have purpose and meaning is absolutely irrational. Your life has a meaning if your life makes a difference. But if all there is is matter, ultimately, your life doesn't matter. The universe does care that you're here. It will care less when you're gone. That's not being cruel. That's being reasonable. And while we're being intellectually honest... Let's acknowledge that denying the existence of God is also a leap of faith. You cannot empirically prove that no God exists. You have taken a faith position. It's a faith position to contend that non-existence produced existence. That non-life produced life. That Non-order somehow became order. See, every assumption about origins wades into the realm of faith. But Scripture affirms that there are good reasons to accept the God assumption. Creation. Go back to verse 3. By faith we understand that the universe was formed at God's command so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible see believing God formed the universe is another example of having confidence in something that I was not there to personally witness but while I didn't see God make the universe I see design and I see order that must be accounted for for. This is the reason hundreds of thousands of the world's most brilliant scientists are believers. Science didn't lead them away from God. It led them to the belief in God. Amen. Listen to the words by perhaps the greatest mind this nation has ever produced. You'll recognize the picture immediately. At his 50th birthday, Einstein was asked, do you believe in God? And he said, I'm not an atheist. The problem involved is too vast for our limited minds. We are in the position of a little child entering a huge library filled with books in many languages. The child knows someone must have written those books. He does not know how. He doesn't understand the languages in which they are written. The child dimly suspects a mysterious order in the arrangement of the books, but doesn't know what it is. That, it seems to me, is the attitude of even the most intelligent human being toward God. We see the universe marvelously arranged and obeying certain laws, but only dimly understand these laws. Now, 
Let's be careful. He did not say, I affirm the God of the Judeo-Christian tradition. He certainly did not say, I believe in Jesus. Here's what he did say. I'm a scientist. I read the universe. And when I read the universe, reason compels me to believe I'm reading something that had to have an author. And so, you think about our planet. And the way it has been finely tuned to sustain life, it is an absolute stunning reality. The distance of the sun, the size of the sun, the placement of the moon, the atmospheric pressure and density, the tilt of the axis, and a myriad other things had to be in a perfect to the decimal point place for life to be sustained. So many things that if this is a cosmic fluke, you are accepting a mathematical absurdity. You have to write a one with so many zeros after it, your hand starts to cramp. Here's what I'm saying. God is not asking human beings to believe in him in spite of a total absence of evidence. God is not saying, I want you to take a leap of faith into the dark. God is saying, I want you to take a leap of faith because there is so much light I've provided for you to believe that leap is worth taking. In fact, Paul would say, In Romans 1, they know the truth about God because he has made it obvious to them. For ever since the world was created, people have seen the earth and sky. So through everything God made, they can clearly see his invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature. So they have no excuse for not knowing God. And so that's where faith begins. Confidence in God's realness. Creation gives powerful testimony that creation has a maker who is wise and powerful. But God doesn't stop there. Faith that pleases God must believe something else. Look again at verse 6. Anyone who comes to God must believe that he is real and that he rewards those who truly want to find him. And so faith worth remembering is not confident, not just in God's realness, but in God's goodness. You see, it would be no comfort to me to believe there is a God and he is great if I didn't think he was good. This is the God that most of the ancient peoples worshipped. The gods of the Babylonians and the Canaanites and, and the Greeks and the Romans. These gods were malevolent and capricious and mean and self-absorbed and the main purpose of religion was to appease them so they would stay off your back and not hassle you. This is not the narrative of the Bible. This is not the God of the Judeo-Christian position. The God of the Bible is a God who from beginning never has a hard time being good. Consistently and thoroughly good. Psalm 31, the writer says, How great is your goodness that you've stored up for those who fear you, that you have given to those who trust you. And notice You do this for all to see. He says God is good in a way you can see. I would argue you can see the goodness of God in creation. Day after day, God would make something and God would put a that's good stamp on it. Not just because it's beautiful, but because it met his intent. What was his intent? God was going to create a perfect planet for children to live on. And everything he did perfectly met that go. You look at creation and you realize God is good. You see the goodness of God in his recreation work. Because God takes sinners like you and me and he transforms them into the image of his son. Our church is filled with hundreds and hundreds of stories that start like this. God found me where I was, and he has taken me where I am. And God has done a good thing in me. In fact, Paul says you were God's masterpiece. Paul says that the God who started a good work in you will bring it to completion on the day that Jesus Christ returns. I see the goodness of God all around my church in your faces. 
And I see the goodness of God in the way he works through circumstances. And again, in our church today, there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of testimonies of seasons when you went through hard times. You didn't want to go through that season. You don't want to go through it again. But you can look back and you can see how God brought good out of it. Again, Paul says, all things work together for the good of those who love him. Doesn't the cross prove that more than anything else? We have a God that can bring good out of nothing like creation. He can bring good out of sinners like you and me. He can even bring good out of evil. We have a God that has no trouble being good. Nobody does good like God. But confidence in his goodness must go one more step. What does the writer say? God is pleased when you believe he's real. And when you believe he rewards people that seek him. That God doesn't play hide and seek from people that want to find him. Again, the psalmist says, you, Lord, are forgiving and good, abounding in love to all who call to you. That God is good to people that want to find him. Several years ago, I read a testimony in Christianity Today magazine. Uh, a Jewish novelist named Andrew Clavin gave his testimony. He grew up in a Jewish family. At 13, he had a bar mitzvah. He was given thousands of dollars of gifts for this special moment, which at first he enjoyed, but then began to resent because he recognized we don't believe in God. We don't pray in this house. We don't read Torah. This is just a meaningless tradition. He took all his gifts, threw them in the trash, and for the next 35 years lived as a self-proclaimed atheist. But he had one problem. How do you find meaning? How do you pursue justice in life? When you've thrown God in the trash. He especially struggled when he experienced kindness. And he noticed particularly kindness from Christian people. So he's a novelist. He loves books. He's in his bed in his late 40s. He's reading a novel. And one of the characters, before he goes to bed, prays a prayer. He says, well, I'm going to try that. Here was his prayer. Thank you, God. That was it. He went to sleep. He woke up in the morning. He said, I was overwhelmed with joy. I couldn't explain it. It wasn't in me. It was above me. It was around me. It was, it was from outside of me. And I'd never felt this kind of joy in my life. He prayed the second prayer he'd ever prayed in his life. He said, God, what can I offer you for what you just gave me? And he heard a voice. Now, again, this guy's an atheist. He's not, he's not expecting anything. He heard a voice. And the voice said, now you should get baptized. What? As he put it, I had three passions in my life. Sex, politics, and malt liquor. And, and get baptized. That isn't just there's a God. That is the God whose son is Jesus. That's the God who just talked to me. He goes and gets baptized. And within one week, his wife says, what has happened to you? And he's been walking with Jesus ever since. Now listen, that's not a weird story. That story could be retold hundreds of thousands of times. That God rewards people that seek him. Even now in our vision, we're supporting missionaries in parts of the world where it can get you in jail to go to church. And yet people are having dreams and visions and they're meeting Jesus. Why? Because God rewards people that seek him. And right now I'm talking to somebody. You're at one of our campuses, you're online, or maybe you're listening to this podcast five months from now. And you need to put Hebrews 11:6 6 to the test. You need to be open to faith. You need to ask God 
to reveal his realness to you. Now listen, don't play games with God. God will not be manipulating. But if you're sincere, and if the attitude of your heart is, God, I want to know your realness. And if you reveal yourself to me, I'm in. I'm all in. See what happens. Be that real and that honest with God. Because the Bible says that God says, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. And what I believe will happen next is a story worth retelling. You see, it pleases God to reward faith because faith pleases God. Think about it. What can we offer God? If he's uncaused, we, he needs nothing from us. We certainly can't offer him our perfect obedience. God says, here's what I'd like. I'd like your confidence that I'm real and that I'm good. That would make me really happy if you would bring me that. I'm real and I'm good. We can offer God our clear perception of what we cannot see. Haven't you been blessed by people like that in your life? A moment ago, we sang one of my favorite all-time hymns. Blessed Assurance. Fanny Crosby, blinded at six weeks of age by a doctor's mistake. And yet, go read her hymns and how often she talks about vision. Visions of rapture now burst on my sight. Watching and waiting, looking above. She couldn't see, but she could see God. And when we believe the God we believe in, we create stories worth remembering. And we please God. And here's the cool thing. Faith that pleases our Father blesses our children. When we honor God with confident faith, we live a kind of life that our kids want to tell their kids, that want to tell their kids, that want to tell their kids. So what do you want to be remembered for? I want my children and my grandchildren and beyond to be encouraged, inspired, and emboldened by the memories of my lived faith. I know I was. I was blessed. I am still blessed by the memory of my mother's father who came to Christ at the age of 56, who went from the hospital to the church to get baptized and left a decades-long battle with alcoholism behind when he found Jesus. I'm blessed by the memory of my father's mother for whom my daughter is named, who for decades was a single, spiritually single mom, taking two boys to church, reading her Bible every day, walking after Jesus with no help from her husband. I would not be here if it wasn't for her faith. I'm blessed by the memories of watching my dad pay bills. And the first check he wrote every week was his tithe to his church. And he was going to tithe before he paid any other bill. And I'll always be blessed by that memory. I'm blessed by the memory of my mother holding her hand in the hospital when she found out she had a deadly cancer, squeezing my hand and saying, you know, son, either way, I win. I'm blessed by the very last memory I have of my wife's mother. Bobby Lida, we're in her living room, and she's praying out loud before bedtime over everyone in the family by name, asking blessings on them and thanking God for his love. I will tell my granddaughter those stories so that she can tell her kids and her grandkids. And maybe she'll have some stories about me. Because here's the thing. In America, we think the whole goal of kids and grandkids is how much money we can make so that we can leave something to them. No. We've done our job well not because we leave something to them, but because we leave something 
in them. And so again, how do you want to be remembered? Because you can have, according to the Hebrew author, you can have an impact on generations for eternity. Lived faith is relived faith. And so make some memories with God. Put a verb to your faith. He'll be pleased. Your kids will be blessed. And you will be remembered. So I'm going to pray over us. Online, every campus, I'm going to pray over us. But I'm going to give you just 30 seconds of silence first. And here's what I want you to do. Ask Holy Spirit to give you a verb. Ask the Holy Spirit right now to give you a verb that you could add to your faith. Do that, please. So, Father, we come to you in the powerful name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We declare that we believe what we do not see, that you are real, and that you are good. You have left so much evidence, and we choose to live in light of this evidence. We choose to live faith, to believe God. And so, Father, be pleased with our faith and grant us opportunity to make some memories that generations after we are gone will still be helping people find Jesus. And in his name we pray, amen. Amen. So now, everyone, please stand up. We're going to sing a song of worship. We're going to offer the gift of prayer. For some of you, that's a verb to add to your faith. Faith seeks prayer. And so you can come and receive that gift. And maybe, maybe right now, some of you are hearing that same voice that that author heard. Go get baptized. That's your next faith step. So we'll offer both gifts to you while you come and while we sing. Our Father everlasting, the all-creating One, God Almighty. Through your Holy Spirit, conceiving Christ the Son, Jesus our Savior, I believe in God our Father, I believe in Christ the Son, I believe in the Holy Spirit, our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection, that we will rise again, for I believe in the name of Jesus. Our judge and our defense. Suffered and crucified, forgiveness is in you. Descended into darkness, you rose in glorious light, forever seated high. I believe in God our Father, I believe in Christ the Son, I believe in the Holy Spirit, our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection, that we will rise again, for I believe in the name of Jesus.
Jesus comes again, for I believe in the name of Jesus. I believe in God our Father, I believe in Christ the Son, I believe in the Holy Spirit, our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection, that we will rise again, for I believe in the name of Jesus, for I believe in the name of Jesus. Good morning, church. Uh, this is our daughter, Madeline, and she's ready to be baptized today. Uh, Madeline, your mom and I know that this is something that you have believed in your heart for a while now and are ready to publicly confess. We know that you have not entered into this decision lightly uh, and that you understand the impact this decision has on your life here on earth and eternity. As you look around, you, may, you see many of the people that have had an influence as you make this confession. They are here to support and encourage you, not only today, but as you grow in your faith. There is much rejoicing here and in heaven today. Madeline, I have some questions for you. Do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, that he lived a perfect life? Yes. That he died on the cross for your sins and he rose, conquering death on the third day? Yes. Are you ready to acknowledge Jesus as your Savior and submit to him as Lord of your life? With that confession, your mom and I are going to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, so that you may receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So, church, I want you to meet David McCollum. David's been visiting McDonald's. here. McDonald's. Yes, sir. Okay, you can tell. We just met. We literally just <laughs> met. David came. To, he's been coming to our church now for several months. And uh, does it come from a home of faith? But uh, he's My been, granny. Your granny. Yes. Okay. And so, Jesus. David, the last several months, has been coming here and uh, wrestling with getting baptized. And as he took communion... He, yes. just, he just heard, today's the day. Today's that He's, day. Today's the day. Yes, sir. So, David, two questions. Yes, sir. Do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God? Absolutely. And do you understand that this is a big moment? By getting baptized, you're saying to God, I, my life belongs to you now. Yes, sir. I do understand this. Okay. Then I'm going to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Man, there, there is no better way to conclude service together and to just celebrate new life in Christ. And so, and so as, as you go this week, uh, man, by faith, you, and then what, what did God help fill in the blank for what that verb is as you walk by faith this week? And maybe, maybe for some, somebody who's online or in person, uh, you, you saw that and, and you're saying, okay, hold on, I, I have more questions. Man, if, if you haven't yet, feel free to text new to the number uh, that's on the screen. We would love to talk to you, uh, whether about being involved at this church or about baptism uh, and what it means to follow Jesus and to have a faith worth remembering. Man, go in faith covered with grace. God bless. Jesus, walking with the one who walks on the sea.